Jill and I go back quite, we have some common roots back in Indiana. Uh, you were faculty at Indiana University School mm -hmm. of Medicine. I was a student years later. Um, and also then when you had your stroke, you were a fellow at McLean Hospital mm -hmm. in Boston, I believe, at mm -hmm. Harvard. Postdoc. That's yes, postdoc, yeah, post yes, post right. Yeah. And then years later, I was a resident there and I'm faculty mm -hmm. there now. So we have those roots. Yes, we do. But one of the stories I will never forget is when we um, spoke on the phone, boy, it's been a while now, and you've been such a great mentor and support for this project, mm -hmm. uh, and you said uh, in 22 years, no doctor's ever asked you how you had a full recovery from your stroke, yeah. as I recall. Yeah. And this is in spite of the fact that you had, I think, the first TED Talk that ever went viral, mm -hmm. had been named one of the most mm -hmm. important people of the year, I think, mm -hmm. by Time Magazine. and. It was a big year. Best-selling book. You have a book in what, uh, something like year. 28 or 30 languages or something. Mm -hmm. And so we need to encourage the medical profession to be curious about mm -hmm. these astonishing stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you called me, it was, uh, I literally said, I I've been waiting 22 years for this mm -hmm. phone call. Uh, I couldn't imagine as a brain scientist having had this experience, mm. having this insight, if I had been somebody else, mm. I would have come to me immediately, I mm. believe, and been curious. Right. Uh, strokes, the number one disabler in our society. Uh. Why, with that major hemorrhage, what happened? I was completely disabled, could not mm. walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. Um, was an infant in a woman's body, and then inside of eight years, somehow figured out how to get the apparatus to work again. I think wow. I'd have made a call. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so how did doctors? So thank you for <laughs> making that call. <laughs> so yeah. how did doctors respond to you over the years? I mean, what was the common refrain, or was there a, was there a common refrain? No, there was never a common refrain. There was really very little conversation. People, uh, doctors would invite me. Uh, I would keynote at uh, neuroanatomy, neurological uh, centers, medical schools, stroke, mm. anything, uh, speech and hearing, PT, OT, everybody at that point, they wanted to hear the story, but nobody actually came to really inquire. And, and you know, I... I'm just, I've been waiting, so <laughs> so tonight has arrived, and you get to be here for the conversation. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's and, and it's an honor for me because in knowing your story and where you've been and how you came into this and the conversations mm. that we've had over the, the last few years, um, uh, you know, we, we have the same frame of mind uh, I might be a little more open-minded about it in the right brain experience. Uh, when you read the book, you will see he is more skeptical about, uh, about these things, and appropriately so mm. with your training. Um, and yet at mm. the same time, you were open to the possibility in a way that other people haven't been so open to the possibility. Mm. So I'm grateful. I think it's a fantastic mm. book. Um, uh, I'd tell you if I didn't think that. Uh, but I think I, it's easy to read. It's um, it, it. You approach. Uh, do you want me to keep talking, or do you want me to? Be oh, quiet? you go right ahead. I think you're trying to tell me I shouldn't medicate anything that happens on the right brain as a psychiatrist. <laughs> well, you might want to be a little open-minded to the possibilities of what's actually going on in there, and maybe we might do that later. We we mentioned we might possibly do that. Um, so, so what I, I love about this book is that um, in it, uh, he talks about Descartes and how um, you tell that story. Well, so it's a fascinating thing. Descartes was, what, what 1600s or so, I believe, and he helped establish the new paradigm that really arose and took hold in the Enlightenment, which was a fabulous thing, but he also... Um, in the way he was interpreted, really separated mind from body and it separated them into a very different worlds that had no contact with each other. Mm -hmm. Now, the truth is, there's a lot more mind and body, I think, in his writings than the way we interpreted it because we took Descartes for our purposes at the time. Mm -hmm. And But what he did was, in dealing with, I think, the larger institution of the Western Church at the time, which had a lot of very clear uh, doctrine around uh, mind and body. By separating the soul and the mind um, into one universe and putting the body into a different universe, that then allowed 
the early scientists to begin actually exploring the body and mm -hmm. they could actually do um, uh, autopsies. They could do dissections, which before it was thought that if you cut up a body or cut into a body, you're actually cutting into the soul and then the person cannot go on mm -hmm. in the right way into the eternal um, mm -hmm. destination, whichever direction that is. Mm -hmm. And um, so by, by doing that, uh, he separated really the dogma away from the human body in a way that allowed exploration to occur. And so mm -hmm. people like da Vinci didn't have to exhume bodies late at night and do their dissections illegally, uh, separate from anyone in the church finding out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it allowed early science to have that area to begin working. And one of the things that I find uh, in resonant with that for you mm. is your own training. Mm. As you are a psychiatrist, an MD trained, mm -hmm. you are also divinity trained. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that excited me about you exploring or mm. the reason why you were choosing mm. to study um, uh, this type of healing, spontaneous healing, was you were open-minded to the possibilities of other ways of looking mm. at the body, other ways right. of thinking about spirituality right. without being afraid of spirituality and the dogma mm. and bringing that together in conversation with modern medicine. Right, yes. So it's a long story about how I went from, I mean, my dad was Amish, and so I was raised in a very rural uh, world. And even though we left that community when I was two, I was really raised still with um, homemade clothing, no TV, radio, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. And then um, started questioning a lot of things early on. And that drove me eventually into a seminary at Princeton. I was mm -hmm. only going to stay for a year. Had wonderful mentors. So nice. I stayed and got the Master of Divinity and then became convinced that science is a fabulous thing. <laughs> and, uh, and discovered, in addition to <laughs> right exactly but in also discovered to. buddhism there yeah, yeah. this whole different way of thinking about the world where you know amish the way spirituality for them is you leave the culture mm -hmm. and you're separate from the culture and so what's spiritual is very different from what's going on in the rest of the world buddhism for example introduced a whole different paradigm because what's sacred is within everything mm -hmm. and the visible world is uh, a very different understanding than what you learn in medicine, mm -hmm. uh, where the physical body is very reified. The physical world is what exists. Mm -hmm. And then living between those two worlds just raises a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't have so many of those questions growing up mm. because for me, uh, I had a brother diagnosed with schizophrenia and it was clear to me mm. that my brother was the closest thing to me that existed in the universe biologically. Mm. So how is it we could have the exact same experience and mm. have completely different perceptions about what happened. So it had uh, to be a biological difference in uh, us in the way our brains wired. Mm. Uh, so that's what motivated me into studying the brain and the neuroanatomy of the brain, and especially mm. the neuroanatomy of, the schi of schizophrenia and the severe mental illnesses, mm. the micro uh, circuitry yeah. of the brain, uh, which cells communicate with which cells, with which chemicals and what quantities right. and what's different right. in your new, your now area of expertise mm. of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And, and so I was cutting up the tissue, looking at the postmortem differences. Mm. And then I experienced the hemorrhage. Oh. And then in four hours, I cannot walk, talk, read, write, recall any of my life. And I shift completely out of my left brain consciousness into the right mm. brain experience of bliss. And the beauty wow. of what comes in the absence of that stress circuitry of the left brain. Mm. And yet, so the brain, the right brain is always on and then the left brain is added on on top of that. And uh. then in the absence of that, I still had this and then eight years to recover that circuitry. And, and so, so as I was reading your book and diving into really the beginning of that, the material of, uh, of nutrition right. and the value of, of nutrition and what it actually means. And, and one of the things that we share is our perception of mm. the body. Uh, this is a body, I am a woman, you are a man, How and we both have blue. Uh, <laughs> we, 
we couldn't have dressed better for one another, I think. Um, she described the shades of blue a lot better than I did. I'm a guy, I know. <laughs> blue. Red, blue, yes. green. <laughs> but, but we see the body as this magnificent collection of cells. Right. And so everything, everything is about the mm. cells and whether it goes back to the division of the mind and the body or the brain and the mind and the body or the soul, there's no division. Ultimately, mm. it is a collection of cells performing a function and what we feed it makes all the difference in the world in the way yes. that it functions in its systems. Yep. So I'm going to let you go off on that yeah, one. No, that's beautifully said. I mean, we have, by late assessments, what, 37.2 trillion cells in our bodies approximately. Mm -hmm. And um, what's fascinating, I mean, you're, you know, neuroanatomist and all that. Um, our neurology, our neurochemistry talks to our immune systems and there's neuroreceptors on our immune cells. So mm -hmm. we have all these brilliant cells in our neurological system, in our mm -hmm. central nervous system, and then we have all these brilliant cells and subtypes of cells in our immune system. Mm -hmm. Wandering. Wandering around. And everywhere. what's fascinating is, I mean, in med school I was taught that we use, we really um, suppress the immune system mm -hmm. is what we do. Uh, chemo, mm -hmm. immune suppression, mm -hmm. uh, or when, a, when we have a fever, we've been taught to use antipyretics to lower the fever. Um, and yet, I think what's true is what these. What's exciting is that things are beginning to change. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have um, immunotherapies, but it's actually a case of spontaneous remission that helped spark the whole field of immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. There was a, I think it's a Dr. Stephen Rosenfeld was a uh, young surgical resident, and this gentleman comes in, known to be someone who drinks a lot of alcohol. Uh, I think he drank a handle of whiskey every day or two. Mm -hmm came in for a cholecystectomy, which is to have his gallbladder removed. And he said, hey, doc, I had, a, um, I had um, stomach cancer about 10 years ago. And Rosenfeld thought to himself, right, there's no way. Gastric carcinoma, no one survives that. You didn't have that. We well, went back and looked at the records. This guy did have it, metastatic <laughs> to the liver. So he went in, did the uh, cholecystectomy, and uh, where the uh, pathology report had said before, the, this knobby, nodular, uh, misshapen liver from the mm -hmm. metastatic uh, gastric carcinoma. Now it's silky smooth, just a perfect looking liver. And so, of course, his thought is, what did this guy drink? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it turns out this guy had uh, just walked off after uh, mm -hmm. being diagnosed. And we don't know how he got better, but that got Dr. Rosenfeld thinking, if there's a way... Is there so he what he did is he injected this guy's blood into another gastric carcinoma patient just to see if there's something in this guy's blood that would get him better. Well, mm -hmm. didn't get him better. The guy died, but um, he then set off and went to NIH and then started this whole field of immunotherapy, and it's been one of the really major leaders in terms of developing these new approaches, which is instead of suppressing the immune system, trying to turn mm -hmm. its superpowers on, mm -hmm. and I think it's just a, a great story about mm -hmm. this new thing that's beginning for us, which I think is very promising for the future, mm -hmm. to fire up the immune system, to find a way to really get it going again. Mm -hmm. And looking at what natural things in the environment inhibit it yes, and suppress it naturally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that when we put uh, processed foods or a lot of chemicals from our foods into our bodies, I think mm -hmm. that has an effect. I think mm -hmm. um, the evidence is accumulating that uh, that's a big issue. The people that I study, when you start to look at the, the science that's developing around the neurochemistry of your body when we are in chronic fight or flight or freeze like most of us are versus the, the neurochemistry, mm -hmm. the, chemi the neurochemistry that bathes your body when you're not in chronic fight, flight or freeze and instead in a parasympathetic mm -hmm. state where you're bathing your body instead in dopamine, the pleasure mm -hmm. pathway, or in serotonin, which is what antidepressants often work with, or in norepinephrine or oxytocin, the love molecule. I mean, when mm -hmm. you start to create that kind of mm -hmm. neurochemical environment in your body, your cells are different. Mm -hmm. If it's cortisol that we're getting all the time, they become immune mm -hmm. to, um, they become numb in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. They become sluggish immunologically. Mm -hmm.
Um, at the basis of this book, yeah. uh, one of the things that I loved about it is when you first spoke with, with me was that you have interviewed over 100 people mm -hmm. who have had spontaneous remission. Mm. And so the journey, your journey, how did you begin with that? How, how because you're an MD, mm. you're a doc, you're a traditional medical mm. mind, and this is something that is taking you out beyond your level mm. of, of comfort zone because yep. it's beyond the comfort zone of your traditional yep. Uh, situation. So how, how did you even mm. begin that process? And then over a hundred people is a lot of people yeah. of documented mm -hmm. cases of, yep. of illness. Yeah. Well, so I got drug into it reluctantly and uh, <laughs> not happily at first. <laughs> so in 2002, <laughs> an oncology nurse at Mass General asked me to meet with her and to explain to her son that she had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. She then went to a healing center in Brazil and began calling me saying that she's getting better and she's seeing other people get better and I need to look into this. And I said, absolutely not. Um, I, I um, was a new faculty member um, at Harvard, a new medical director, and maybe uh, it doesn't say much about the pursuit of truth, but I was concerned about what my colleagues would think. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think anything was likely to be going on anyway. And so I said no. So Nikki was stubborn. She began having people call me from around the country and elsewhere saying that they had medical evidence for their recoveries and did I want to hear the stories. So I said no. <laughs> <laughs> Repeated it. I kept saying no, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So, but then eventually I did end up going down to Brazil, and that's where this whole thing started, and it's gone a lot of places since then. But my criteria were, um, you had to, for, for, I told people that I wouldn't even look at their situation unless they had um, a genuinely incurable illness according to all that we um, understand in medicine. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, I really wanted to only look at the diseases where there's no question there's something you got to figure out here. Mm -hmm. And then my second criteria was um, there had to be medically indisputable evidence for accurate diagnosis and clear evidence for recovery. And, and then number three, there couldn't be some other explanation that could potentially mm -hmm. explain how they got better, like a experimental chemotherapy agent or something like that. So I held to those three criteria. So CURED looks at really serious illnesses because um, yeah, I, it's a very personal and professional journey to figure out what's true here. Mm -hmm. So I needed pretty tough cases. <laughs> <laughs> he was a skeptic. Yes, yes. So once you were down in Brazil mm. and you witnessed different experiences, mm -hmm. different uh, food was different down there. Yeah. Uh, so that was contributing. Prayer was down there. Mm -hmm. So that was bringing in a more spiritual, energetic, right. uh, a bondedness of mm -hmm. connectivity between people there. Right. The love that was there, and people were getting better. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the prof what the the few books have been written about it and what they, they often would say was that they said that 90 to 95 percent of people come down here and are healed. Well, it wasn't anything close to that. You mm -hmm. actually um, look at what's going on. And I don't know what percentage actually was getting better, but it's a complicated thing because mm -hmm. the human longings around all of these, I mean, these are life and death illnesses that had really caused a lot of suffering in people's lives. And so... Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes people wanted to believe they were getting better, but the evidence didn't support that. Um, there's a lot of complicated factors that go into these stories, and so it took me a while before it began to become less confusing to me what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so. one would think that automatically just being in that environment, mm. I mean, I want to go now just because I just want to go. Right. Uh, don't you want to go? You'll want to go. <laughs> After you read the book, we'll all be down there together. Um, one of the most obvious differences, though, is that when you go to an environment like that, all your normal stressors, right. well, not all of them, because they're still mm. in your mind, right. and a part of your heart is still at home, right. but everything is changing 
And when you're in a new environment and someone else is providing all your food and now your plant-based food, right. uh, which is not the normal American diet, right. and you're in an environment that with other people who are in deep prayer and in deep love, right. the power of that kind of an environment. Right. What was that like for you as the MD? How right. do you look at the situation where people are getting better and and account for this stuff right. called love right. and connection mm -hmm. and build that into what how that helps with that stress response right. which decreases then see I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book, I have to say. But how that truly influences the whole picture yeah. of what we are, because we're not just a this, a that, and the other. Right. We're all of it. Mm -hmm. And they've set up an environment down there. And of course, it doesn't have to be just there. The environment could be set up in other places. Right. But the key factor, so, so, so first of uh, all, how do you manage love? And right. second, talk about, str about stress yeah. and the well, those power are, of stress. Yeah, those are great questions, big ones. Let me deal with stress first because your second, your other, well, about love is a little bit more difficult for a psychiatrist to talk about. <laughs> 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 Although I will say, I've been, I, my, I had a professor <laughs> that joked, I wrote um, a book review on Mark Epstein's wonderful book um, um, a number of years ago. Um, and he's a Buddhist psychiatrist, which I saw his name up here. And my professor, um, he said, that's the first time in the New England Journal of Medicine the word love's ever been allowed into the journal. Wow. So, <laughs> so yeah. Falling to Pieces Without Falling Apart, I think was the name of Mark Epstein's mm. book, which is a wonderful book. So, um, so, so your question about stress is a mm -hmm. big one. I mean, I think it's a big topic. We've talked a little bit about the neurochemistry of stress and the neurochemistry of love or a mm -hmm. parasympathetic and more healing state of mind. Um, I, think, I think when I talk in Cured about the need to, to deal with the four pillars of healing, vitality, and well-being, and nutrition is one, mm -hmm. uh, healing our stress response is one of those pillars, I believe, I, I think some stress is good. Mm -hmm. We all need challenge stress to help us learn and grow. Running the New York City Marathon can be challenge stress if it helps you reach into your higher self and realize that you're capable of more than you realize. Um, and great athletes stress their muscles a lot, but they also have a rest and repair cycle that's critical for repairing the muscles that you put micro tears in during the mm -hmm. workout sessions. But that's a very different thing uh, than toxic stress, uh, mm -hmm. which if you're in a toxic relationship or mm -hmm. in a work environment that leaves you depleted at the end of every day, not knowing your value and your worth, then mm -hmm. you're going to be in chronic fight, flight, or stress, and you're not going to be able to heal properly. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then I think something needs to change. Either you need to change your environment or you need to change your relationship with your environment. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about the relationship with the environment because that mm. leads us to the micro. What, what was the phrase? Micro you used? tears. Yeah. The 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 little the little touches of life. What did you call oh, it? Oh, micro, micro moments of positivity yes, resonance. Yes. Yes. Say that oh, again. Right. That was a big one. <laughs> Say that's why I didn't. Even, yes. What was that again? So Barbara Fredrickson is yes. this amazing researcher at I think University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. She's written this book called Love 2.0, which is just fits in so nicely with the research that I've been doing because she talks about the importance of love in our mm -hmm. lives and of connection. And by that, she doesn't mean romantic love mm -hmm. um, or, um, or that sort of thing. What she means is that every day that uh, she talks about the vagus nerve, uh, and we mm -hmm. talked a little bit about the vagus nerve. It's the super highway of the parasympathetic nervous system in our body. And when you, when your mouth curves into a smile when you're trying to connect to somebody, or when our eyes twinkle and as we connect to somebody, that's the vagus nerve using all of its things to mm -hmm. connect us to people and all that sort of thing. And she has done brilliant research to show that whether it's the milkman or a person we meet on the street or somebody at the bank, if we just mm -hmm. have just can let ourselves mm -hmm. enjoy and connect with them, make mm -hmm. eye contact and enjoy them, 
that does fabulous things for our nervous system. Mm -hmm. It gets us out of fight or flight into a mm -hmm. healing parasympathetic state. And there's just a profound neurochemistry around mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. so I don't know if that gets into your question a little bit. But. Well, it, it does for, for, as a neuroanatomist, the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve coming out of the brainstem and it heads down into the body and it's responsible for really everything mm -hmm. that's going on inside of your body. Uh, as far as uh, movement of the heart, movement of everything in their gut, everything. So it's just this enormous highway for information. And what I found mm. fascinating, which I did not know, is that you can actually measure the health and the well-being of someone's yes. vagus nerve. And uh, this isn't how I think. I think that there's a nerve there and it is what it is. I don't think about it as you need to exercise yeah. a nerve in order to have a healthier vagus right. nerve. Yeah. And, and the research was showing that you could have a dull vagus nerve, which essentially means that you're isolated, mm. you're perhaps lonely, you may live alone, you're not having a lot of <laughs> human connection, and that the connection actually needs to be in person. Right. And, and I wonder, I ha do have to wonder though, I have pets, and, uh, and I, I live on a boat part of the year and there's uh, like heron go by and I, I hello my heron as it goes by. I'm wondering if that counts because it's, <laughs> you know, it's part of my heart connection, you know, and, and, I, and there are chipmunks and there are creatures. It's hello, you know, and I'm, I'm happy. I figured they are too. So, so, and then I wonder, I have so many friends now who are doing Skype with their grandchildren uh, or, or, or relationships through right. Skype and that there is this, this real connection that we're yeah. being able to get in other ways. So, so mm -hmm. I do wonder if she has studied different ways of making that connection because one of the comments you had in the book was mm -hmm. that, that you might talk to your mom and that gives you a, a, your, a little bit of a Vegas buzz and a little joy. But if you have a conversation with your neighbor that's face to face, that's more of a love hit yes. that actually they can show strength in that, right. that vagus nerve. Yes. And, and why I find this so important is because uh -huh. the love, the love, when I experienced my stroke and I was completely disconnected from my stress right. circuitry, uh -huh. it was delightful. I mean, if I, you know, everyone should have that experience, but, but not. So, but for me, it was absolutely delightful because it shifted off the stress circuitry yeah. completely. I didn't, I, I didn't know what a mother uh, was, much less who my mother was, but I was uh, perfect and whole and beautiful just the way that I was. Right. And so were you. Uh, and the circuitry that defined the boundaries of where I begin and where uh, I end was turned off. So, so you're a part of the uh, love, you know, it right. was just became this big love fest thing. And then the circuit comes back online and stress circuitry starts coming back online and everything changes <laughs> uh, with that. And then it's a matter of to know uh, that you can train that circuitry right. and by purposefully uh, engaging not just with yourself in a positive uh, emotional state, yeah. but in a positive cognitive state and to that, that we have so much uh, power yes. over what's going on inside of ourselves at any moment. And the remarkable thing that, of course, the whole package c uh. comes to me as is all of that is one big ball of everything and it all mm. matters. And so uh. someone might change their mm. diet or not change their diet, right. but the attitude might change and be enough that changes everything. So, so right. go from there. Well. <laughs> <laughs> That's a deep well where there's a lot to talk about there. <laughs> Anywhere so, you want to go. So, yeah. I mean, okay, so the right brain, you had access to your right brain and yes. not to your left brain, yes. fair to say. So you had access to your, to your eastern mind, but not your western brain in some yes. ways, one could also say, right? Yes. And so um, that's, there's a lot... To talk about with all of that yeah um, so I mean what is what is it to live in the eternal present with joy and peace um, but you needed 
eventually you decided that that was not enough, right? You decided to Oh, also... you're completely non-functional human being. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're absolutely completely blissful, but you have no idea of anything. I mean, seriously, I mean, that's... Right. that's so, so for me, right. that's what it's about. We are whole, right. living whole brain. To me, the evolution yeah. of humanity is heading toward whole brainness. Yeah. And, and so that's essentially what right. you are doing in this book mm. is you're coming and saying, we're, we're not just whole brain, we are whole everything. Mm -hmm. We have to meld what we eat as physical physical mm -hmm. creatures, this beautiful collection of cells. And what do they mm -hmm. need? And energetically, how do we mm -hmm. get the energy to flow? And right. when I was in that condition, I was very blissful and peaceful. Right. I would sit on the couch with a goofy grin on my face. <laughs> and my mother would say, child, why are you so happy? And I didn't have any language, so I didn't know, and I uh, didn't care. All I knew was uh, I was alive. Yeah. And when you go and you just go into the state of gratitude mm. for I'm alive, and mm. I think that many of the patients who you studied, mm. they, they separated themselves from the disease. I was yes. not my stroke. Right. My body had a stroke. Right. Okay, what do I need to give my body in order to help it heal? Well, right. the number one thing for me was sleep. Yes. And then I, we, I didn't have any control over what I was eating, so that wasn't it for me. Right. But spiritually, I was so happy I was alive, I was just happy. Right. And imagine what that's saying to the whole system. Right. It's yep. saying, let's flow. Because as soon as there's stress and there's discontent and there's unhappiness uh, and there's self-criticism, everything constricts and shuts down. Right. And if you have all these different chapters that need to be open for healing to mm -hmm. happen, how does one do that? And I feel like this book really addresses all of those. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the brilliance of Western culture, right, is that we can divide things down into their constituent parts and go all the way down into the subatomic level mm -hmm. or out into space, right? And so if you got a medical problem, you go see the doctor. If you go see, you have a psychological problem, you go see the psychotherapist. If you have a spiritual problem, you go see the priest, rabbi, imam, or minister. But every, every one of these is trained to look at the world through their specialty. And it's the same with doctors. Doctors, if you go see a gastroenterologist, they're going to look at everything through the gastrointestinal system. Psychiatrist looks at everything through the brain but like you said we are all of these things and the vitality and health mm -hmm. and the healing possibilities come from integrating all of these mm -hmm. but if the specialists are only working through their their narrow mm -hmm. aperture into reality then their advice is not going to take into account or mm -hmm. give you what you need to heal or what you need to find vitality and so I think we need to be able to stand back and look at the forest for the trees, mm -hmm. which is much more what the East really mm -hmm. historically knows how to provide, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. which looks at the big picture. Yeah, I think it's kind of the left brain, left culture, mm -hmm. Western, right. right brain, right culture, Eastern. Right. And we're going to find our answers in that mm -hmm. uh, that infinite passive both right. together. Yep, and that's so. going to be in that evolution of those yep. two hemispheres I think that's uh, together. Right. Yep. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. I think we have no idea of the possibilities that are mm -hmm. become possible when we begin to bring these different perspectives into mm -hmm. dialogue. So I bet everybody's dying to know, what changes have you made in your life since uh, <laughs> you've learned all this? That's just for the patients. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've made, I'm a different person. <laughs> mm -hmm. When you look back at pictures of me in 2003 when I was first in Brazil, mm -hmm. I, um, when I gave up processed foods and most of the refined sugars and that sort of thing, um, I lost 40 pounds without making any other changes in my life. Mm -hmm. um, my Talk about numbers... sugar while you're on that. Sugar. The yeah. molecule. Okay, so it's sugar. fascinating. Yeah, so 100 years ago, the average person ate approximately four pounds of sugar a year, no big deal. Uh, now, on average, we consume 154 pounds of sugar a year. And it's so we're so far outside of having a software and a hardware system that can cope with that that uh, it's shocking. And the book really goes into some detail around all of this. Um, I think, I mean, 
we were talking earlier today about the way these sharp edges of mm -hmm. sugar, how they go through our cardiovascular system and cause these little microcuts into the endothelium. The endothelium is a really, really important part of our bodies, but it's one cell layer thick. And so you keep cutting that up and causing a, a repair response to have to be constantly going on. Not only is that consuming a lot of energy in your immune system, it's causing this scarring that happens over time. Mm -hmm. And we now know that the truth is um, you, don't have a pro you don't have a diabetes problem, you don't have a heart problem, you don't have a blood pressure problem, you don't have a cancer problem, you don't have an autoimmune problem, you have an inflammation problem, mm -hmm. a chronic inflammation problem in our body. And so, and it's just a matter of time until the weakest organ in your body will um, fail or some stress comes along, like a partner leaves you or something like that, and then you will have um, a precipitating event that will leave you with a major medical problem. And mm -hmm. so how do you um, heal your, uh, the inflammation, the chronic inflammation in your body? Well, that's really about healing the immune system. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so that's a little bit of of that. What else did you ask me? Well, to me, the, the most interesting thing about that little piece of it, not that that mm. wasn't all fascinating, right. is that because it's cells, you know, and when you stop and you think that everything in there is a cell, which means everything has a function. They have a, mm. a structure that is designed to do something. And the linings of the of, mm. of all of the everything that gets lined, the blood vessel, uh, your mouth, mm. the digestive tract, right. everything that has a line, the, all of it. Mm. Um, these are beautiful cells that are are weaved together tightly in order to perform their function. And just the concept, and mm. I didn't know this, just mm. the I'd love to see a molecule, sugar mm. molecule, you should put uh. it on your, your next version of the book, uh, <laughs> to think that the molecule itself has sharp edges. Yeah. And all of that sugar that we're consuming, uh. it's not just going in and doing what it does, it's razor sharp cutting things mm. as it goes. Right. So imagine what that does to mm. the vascular system mm -hmm. and to the digestive tract. Mm -hmm. And what we now know to be true about the microbiome and right. the entire mm -hmm. uh, role, uh, it has its own uh, nervous system. Yep. Uh, and then, and just the whole cardiovascular system, it has right. essentially its own little nervous system with some 40,000 neurons in there. Um, uh, I see the immune system as, as the peripheral version of the central nervous mm. system, which is in position. Right. So you have the nervous system that you think of, and it's in position, and it doesn't move. It does all of the things that it does. But then the immune system is the, the, the armed forces that are going yes. out and making things happen. Right. And so we put inflammation in there. We put sugar in there. It tears up all these little things. Right. The immune system now goes in. Right. And it's the level of stress is going up inside of the body and it gets to a point where it's just on. Yeah. And that's your right. inflammation. Can you yep. talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, that's well said. I think that chronic inflammation is the common pathway of disease for all of these mm -hmm. diseases. See, what doctors, we specialize in body parts and that's what we do is we study body parts. So. We always thought it was a heart problem or it was a gastroenterological problem or a brain problem. Well, it's not. It's mm -hmm. an inflammation problem. Yeah. And so these diseases, it's, being, it's a really exciting time in medicine because we're finally starting to see the forest for the trees and realize that, oh, it's an inflammation problem. We mm -hmm. need to decrease the inflammation. So how do we do that? So, so the, 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 I know so, you're all asking. So, Ask him that. Yeah. <laughs> so... We have about probably 10 minutes left or so uh, before we go to questions. So I'll just describe what I, um, based upon studying these people who are the ultimate achievers in health, um, the reason why we have not studied them for um, the history of medicine, I think is uh, there's a couple of reasons, but, but in the way we do science at this time, we, re we reduce everything around the mean, the average. That's what we look at. Well, these people have been around forever. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more of them than we think there are, but they're the ultimate achievers. They're the ones who get screened out in the studies. They're the ones who 
aren't doing what the people in the normal mm -hmm. curve are doing. You and throw us out, in other words. They really throw us out. They throw <laughs> right, us exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah, and we're not we even interested. Count. Right. Exactly. We're not in your normal curve. Right. When doctors say you've got six months left to live, that's mm -hmm. on average what uh, mm -hmm. one can expect. But we're not looking at the outliers, and it turns out you are doing something completely right. different than right. what uh, we've been teaching patients to do for eons. Mm -hmm. So... So the four pillars, which I mentioned a, little, mentioned a little bit, I'll just kind of go through those mm -hmm. a little bit quickly. Um, and the first pillar of well-being and vitality, I say, is nutrition. And I say, uh, by that, I mean eat the good stuff, mostly plants. Um, eliminate processed foods, sugars, and refined flours from your diet. If you want to eat meat, then eat animals that were happy when they were alive, not with stress hormones flooding their bodies. Um, and, you know, eat grass-fed so that you have the omega-3s, the healthier fats, and not the, the more problematic fats, and, and not with chemicals mm -hmm. pumped into them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big topic around all of those things. And then the second pillar is, I think many of us need to uh, heal our stress response. Um, that's getting out of chronic fight or flight. That's uh, learning how to nurture the parasympathetic like, mm -hmm. like we've talked about. Uh, that's changing our relationship with the environment or changing the environment uh, if it's a toxic environment. I can't tell you how many times Jan, who I talk about in the book, who had end-stage lupus, had lupus in her brain, in her heart, in her kidneys when she went to Brazil and mm -hmm. then lo and behold, she'd been ill her whole life mm -hmm. and then she gets better to the point that she showed me her pictures when she was, um, when she was still ill and when she was in stage and within a few weeks of death. Um, and I didn't recognize her. The woman sitting in front of me was not the same person mm -hmm. um, in that photo. And she said when she goes back to Idaho, she will walk down the street and see people that she has known her entire life and they don't recognize her. So she got well, she went back to Idaho, back into a toxic work and marriage, got ill again, mm -hmm. came back, got mm -hmm. better, and then got the point. And now she's living in northern Idaho. <laughs> and she's this lovely, just, just, her eyes just radiate with peace and happiness. And, and it's, it's a fast, I mean, these things are complicated, right? Mm -hmm. So she's got um, three children, uh, has a very close relationship with one, two that don't speak to her because they only never knew her when she was ill. She'd been ill. That's the only way they'd ever known her. I mean, so these, these are really human stories. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've done nutrition and stress, and you have to heal your immune system. We've talked a bit about that tonight. Mm -hmm. That's the third pillar, what it means to fire up your immune system uh, mm -hmm. rather than create a um, living chronic stress that really depletes your immune system. And then I'm, I tell stories specifically in the book that show that even though these factors are really important, there's some people like you who didn't do all of these factors. You didn't change your nutrition. Mm -hmm. You couldn't even feed yourself for a while. Um, and so these factors are important, but they're not the whole story. The fourth pillar is the one that really seems to wake people up and they want to tell me about why they are so grateful in retrospect mm -hmm. that they had this illness. Mm -hmm. And because it gave them such mm -hmm. a different relationship with themselves and with their life. It mm -hmm. so fundamentally changed their identity mm -hmm. that Dr. Kane, for example, who was diagnosed by biopsy with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis back in the mid 90s, mm -hmm. she um, basically what happens with that disease, uh, your lungs turn to cardboard and you die. You can't exchange oxygen. Mm -hmm. um, and so you die from oxygen starvation, basically. She was sleeping 18 to 20 hours a day because she wasn't able to exchange much oxygen um, and even though she was on oxygen. And, um, and then she went through a two-year process of um, working with a healer and also fundamentally changing her relationship with herself and her understanding of her value, came out the other side of it. And these fibrotic lungs, which are not supposed to be able to mm -hmm. change, had gotten a lot better. And now she is so grateful for what the illness gave to her in terms mm -hmm. of a level of well-being and health that she uh, now works as a physician in her mid-70s doing home visits with really ill people. 
and because she feels this is a return she can make because of what the illness gave her. She also does this thing, sends out a daily email called Doc's Daily Chuckle and mm -hmm. believes that humor is such an important mm -hmm. part of, mm -hmm. um, of healing and of well-being. Mm -hmm. And you know, all of these people I've interviewed over the years, they talk about how grateful they are for the illness because mm -hmm. of what it gave them. And what it gave them was a different identity. Jan mm -hmm. goes by a different name now. Huh. Uh, people sometimes have such a deep change in identity huh. that they go through a name change. Huh. They're not who they were. Huh. Yeah. And they don't look like who they were. Wow. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think what I believe is the fourth pillar is the really important one. Uh, it's the one that is about changing your beliefs so that you know your value, you mm -hmm. know your worth, and you don't question that the mm -hmm. same way. You don't uh, have this little voice that's uh, <coughs> judging you or condemning you. Um, mm -hmm. You set up a life that honors mm -hmm. what uh, you bring into the world. One of the most common things that people have said to me over the years is that it took an illness for them to realize that they needed to stop taking care of everyone else. Mm -hmm. They needed to stop responding to the perceived expectations of others and instead make the hard choices of setting up a life that honored their own mm -hmm. well-being that mm -hmm. allowed them to have the kind of life that put a light in their eyes yeah. that really mattered to them. Mm -hmm. And to ask those questions, I mean, it, those are hard choices to make, to set up a life like that. Mm -hmm. And when you make those hard choices, it will absolutely change the relationship you have with others and the relationship you have with yourself. And mm -hmm. what I really believe is that when those kinds of choices are made and that's what you put into your life, mm -hmm you take the lid off of what becomes possible in your mind and your body. Beautiful. So Beautiful. And, and you know, one of the, the, I think, really special things about this book in particular and about you is that the stories in your book are real stories of real people with real medical issues, and they're doing both. Mm -hmm. They're doing a medical protocol yep. that they feel is right, yep. so it's not a rejection right. of the medical world, Absolutely but it's true. a figuring out what part of medicine, mm -hmm. traditional medicine, feels right for me. Do I want to do chemo? Do I want to do radiation? Right. Do I just want to do chemo or just radiation mm -hmm. or not do that and do something else? Right but there's those protocols yep. that are appropriate. Yep. And then at some point the individuals have drawn a boundary and said, but this is me right. and this is my life. Right. And if I have a limited amount of time with a terminal illness, right. then how do I want to live? What do I want my relationships yes. to look like? And wh what is right. my relationship with myself? Right. And so because of that, you end up with everything, you get the power yes. of both sides of the team. Yes. And you actually have a team. And and right. this perspective has the power then to use both. Yes. And to move the power of traditional medicine more into an acceptance and an understanding of yep. the power of what we are as the individual, right. as well as take the power of the individual and use what you need yeah in the medical system and let them work together. Yeah, absolutely too. Yeah. It's a very, and every person did that in their own way. And they do it in their yes, own way. They do it in their own yeah. way. It's fascinating because one person will not want to spend the last few months of their life sitting in a dark doctor's office with people who are dying. Mm -hmm. But another person, it's an opportunity to get the best they can mm -hmm. get. And yeah. if every disease is also different with its own trajectory. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many people have had the experience that it took a fatal diagnosis for them to finally be free to live the life that was for them. Yeah. You know, yeah. when they were finally didn't have to be mm -hmm. a doctor because their parents wanted right. them to be a doctor. Right. They finally could do what they wanted to do with their lives. And right. that itself was the life giving doorway, I think, yeah. into a different life. Yeah. Yeah. So having that kind of an illness is such a wake up call. Right to this is my life mm -hmm. and it is finite right and it almost ended right. and uh. what do i want to be now and right. you know people look at my life and i've gone back to being 
a neuroscientist or a mm. neuroanatomist, but I'm not in the lab anymore. I'm not doing right. what I did before, but I went back to teaching gross anatomy right. and neuroanatomy, but I really only did that because mm. it was easy for me mm -hmm. because the right brain still had the picture and I could sculpt for you an abdomen. I just lost the left brain language. Right. And I had to eventually come up with, you know, making a living. So I went back to being a neuroanatomist, but that wasn't my goal in the beginning. Right. Um, so so we, you, you figure out, well, how do I weave my life now? But how do I, how do I value the people? Because mm -hmm. in the big picture of it all, it for me, uh, it still boils down to the love. Yes. And it's the love of honoring the fact that I am life. Yeah. I did not die that day. Mm -hmm. And and I I have life. And what matters is you and how we light that little spark inside of ourselves and make our little vagus nerves stronger so that we can all sparkle a little brighter. So, so to me, that's kind of what the book, the beauty of this book is your happiness bring our sparkle back. And then if we have an illness, you're helping us figure out how might we bring our sparkle back? That's because fabulous. when you have that power inside of you and that power is, we all have that power. Um, we talked about me possibly doing something. That's right. Would you mind if I did that? Absolutely. Okay, we're going to do something special. If you would, you're in agreement, right? I would like everyone to stand. Okay, put your things down, be comfortable. Now, we're going to think about what are the differences between what's going on in your right brain and what's going on in, in your left brain because they're completely different environments. They're completely different groups of cells doing completely different things with the same information coming in. So if you feel comfortable, I would like for you to close your eyes. As you stand there, I want you to put both your feet about shoulders length apart and balance yourself and realize that the left brain controls the right side of your body. Your right brain controls the left side of your body. You are this completely beautifully integrated entity, this living being. And as you stand in that space, you stand there as both of these, both of these magnificent ways of being in the world. So I just want you to take a big deep breath and Ah, be who and what you are, and isn't that lovely? This is who we are in this moment. And then I want you to take a small step to the right. And as you take a small step to the right, you're stepping into the consciousness of your right brain. And your right brain is completely focused on what is right here, right now. And right here, right now is a perfect moment. And in this moment, we are perfect and we are whole and we are beautiful. And I want you to take another big, deep breath, pulling the energy up through your legs and let your chest expand and let your head lift a little. And there's a light around us and feel that energy of what you are. Right here, right now, you are the life force power of the universe. You're the life force power of all those cells making up your body. And let your shoulders relax and just feel, feel this beauty of being a living being. This is who you are in your right brain, right here right now. So take a big deep breath and feel that energy inside of you. And let that out. Ah, lovely. Now I want you to step right back into the middle again and go back and you feel that little tingly glow now. There's a glow about you. But this is you in your right brain and in your left brain again. You're stable, you're solid, you're both. Now I want you to take a small step to your left. And as you step into the left, you're stepping into the consciousness of your left brain. And your left brain is going to take you into your past and it's gonna project you into your future. So it's the mind and the language going on inside of there. And this is going to in inhabit that stress circuit. And in that stressful circuit, I want you to think about your job. <laughs> I want you to think about your familial relationships. 
I want you to think about your finances <laughs> and it's tax season. And I want you to let your shoulders drop. And I want you to relax your knees and feel this is the weight of your life. Your left brain is brilliant in its ability to organize that data, but this is our stress circuitry and all the things that bring us from our past and all the emotional pain of our past. Feel that. And I don't know about you, but mine sounds like, <sighs> so take a big deep breath in that left brain and go, <sighs> beautiful. Now, I want you to step back into the middle, and I want you to shake that off a little bit and let yourself be solid in the mid, just in both. And now I want you to take that little step back to the right. And as you take that little step back into the right, let your chest lift, lift up, let your shoulders loosen up, feel the lightness in your body, feel the little glistening glow, all those little micro connections with people and other, just the energy of what you are. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> take a big deep breath and be that. And then let that go. And now step into the middle. Now, do you want me to take you back into the other one again? <laughs> Probably not. Okay, open your eyes. Now, the thing about this is that both of these consciousnesses are you. They are different anatomical machines in there calculating and organizing that information. And at any moment in your life, at any moment, somebody's talking to you, rah, 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 Take a step that. to the right. <laughs> <laughs> let your shoulders and your sh chest, let yourself be that because that is you. It's always there. You always have the power to bring your mind to the present moment. I don't have to rah, 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 he's rah, 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 and I mean, I don't have to rah, 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 rah back. That is my left brain engaging in that toxicity of that relationship. I don't have to go in there and do that. I can gently step to the right. He has no clue what I've done. I'm patient. I'm compassionate. I put up with as much of it as I'm going to. And then I manage myself without having to do that right back. All right? Helpful? Mm. OK, thank you. Yeah. Well, now we've brought the lights up on ourselves Perfect. and our real reality, we can uh, perhaps try out some questions. We don't have that much time, but we do have a book signing afterwards, so you might be able to have a chance to do that. So uh, we've got microphones on either side of the house. I can see hands going up, and there's one right in the back. Let's start at the back. That's so good. Yes, yes, a mic's coming right to you. Thanks so much. And who else on this side? Let's go right to the front, Debbie. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angie, and first of all, thank you for that amazing talk. We mm -hmm. learned so much from it. Um, my question is for um, Jill, actually. What is your experience of emotions now after you've had this experience of bliss? Mm. Mm. Well, when I lost that left brain, I lost all my past, all my emotional baggage. That was the greatest gift I ever received. <laughs> so imagine that reboot, but it began again. It, it, I had to start as an infant again with relearning what emotions were. My mother had to, I would describe, I, I am gritting, I'm, 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 my shoulders are tight, my chest is tight. And she would say, Jill, that's anger. That, that is anger. Or, or my heart is, is wrenching. And she would say, Jill, this, this is sadness. So I had to relearn those. And now I'm just like pretty much I was before, uh, 22 years later, but I'm at the 22-year-old age. So I, I have re-engaged re, re with that circuitry because it's all circuitry inside of my brain. But because of this experience that I've had in my right brain, I can look at it more objectively and realize, feel what's coming on to me and what is my new relationship is, is actually looking at that character as a character because that has a personality. And, and when I have a relationship with that personality, then I get to look at the other characters inside of me now and have a, uh, uh, you know, a big old party inside. 
Wow. But it's different. It's very different. Because so you've I, integrated. You know, well, it's not integrated. They're actually, it taught me, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm writing book number two. I'm going to take this moment. <laughs> I'm writing book number two. And book number two is exactly that. What have I learned about the brain in the re, rebuilding of my own left hemisphere? What's going on in that circuitry? And what relationship do we have between what's going on in the right brain and what's going on in the left brain? Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Congratulations on your new, on your new book. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello. So Dr. Jeff, I just want to say as a practitioner of the kinds of healing you describe in your book, someone who grew up in a family where this was normal and then came to the US and is used really? to the conversation around it. I just wanna thank you for writing this book. Uh, and my question to you is, what is your advice, and Dr. Jill, you can hop on this too. What is your advice to those of us who are doing this kind of work? Uh, how do we help facilitate this conversation? How do we work with uh, modern medicine to make this mainstream? And is there gonna be a Cure 2.0 where you study people that are people like Dr. Neme and people that are doing this work? So. Well, it's a great question. We need more conversation between all this. We need more research. We need more um, of a platform where people can share their stories about what really got them better um, in this kind of way because I think that also draws out these kinds of things because people who got better, it wasn't, it wasn't the medications that got them better. And so, um, it really gets into the kinds of modalities that you um, probably are much more familiar with. And I think also what has been helpful to me is to be in some of these different cultures which have such different assumptions about the way in which the mind and the body and other parts of us are related to each other that that's been a big education. Mm -hmm. and I'd like yeah. to just add to that the beauty of this book, I believe, is that we have an MD who has come in, who has his mm. training, divinity training, so who, who is take care, helping care, create that bridge between what we know about modern traditional medita um, uh, medicine and spirituality. And, and so I think this, this is going to open up that conversation even more and it, it'll be beautiful. I, I, mm. I think it'll do beautifully. And very important. Great, we've got a question in the middle of the house here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, could either of you discuss the placebo effect and the status of our understanding of it and how that understanding has evolved uh, since its first findings, I think in the 50s mm -hmm. roughly, uh, some of which have been debunked or re-undebunked mm -hmm. or whatever? Uh, yeah. Great question. Uh, placebo, I talk about that and cured uh, to some degree. It's a really big topic. There's some evidence that the placebo effect is growing, which has been freaking out pharmaceutical companies because um, the, it used to be that uh, placebo um, was not as strong as antidepressants, for example. Uh, but it turns out that it's becoming more difficult for um, antidepressants, for example, to beat the placebo effect. And, so they're having to take down some of the walls between the pharmaceutical companies to begin figuring out how to work together to figure out what to do. The placebo effect, I think it's just one, uh, I mean, you know, the placebo effect can vary from 30 to 90% um, in studies in terms of the power of what's going on. And the standard rule of thumb is it's 30% by and large, and it, but it actually varies. That's actually uh, can vary a lot and it depends. We know that um, uh, surgery is a stronger, stronger placebo than a pill. We know that I think it's red pills are stronger than blue pills. Um, <laughs> big pills are stronger placebo response than small so pills. Republican pills are better than Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're at just more At least in terms of anesthesia, right? <laughs> But, you know, what's fascinating, you know, the, the knee arthroscopy surgery, for example, is a very common surgery. I forget how often it's done around the United States every year, but it's a really common surgery. Well, it's been proven that, um, that it is just as strong as placebo. I mean, placebo, if you make a little incision on a person's knee and suture it, 
you're going to have as good a result as if you get the actual <laughs> surgery. So the placebo mm. response is very strong, and there's been some studies mm. recently that have shown that even if you know it's a placebo, right. <laughs> that it still is going to have an effect. And so <laughs> the mind is really powerful. <laughs> so do you think it's about attention? I think it's about a lot of things. I mm -hmm. think it's about, I don't think we've even begun to really fully map it. Um, you know, there, there have been spontaneous remissions around placebo responses. And mm -hmm. so uh, and it's around, there's around susceptibility of uh, belief. It's around the culture of care that, um, that when a person <coughs> sees um, someone who they believe uh, is a healer, that it, that that will mm -hmm. activate the placebo response. It, the caring that a provider shows towards a patient activates the placebo mm -hmm. response. The uh, kind of attention that's paid. I mean, I think there's a lot of things probably tied up in that that we have not fully mapped. So that leads me to um, a passage in your book towards the end where you uh, talk about AI and it's, uh, mm -hmm. the sort of technology and yeah. that's uh, sort of infiltrating the medical world. And uh, you say something very revealing that AI can do lots of things in terms of processing data, but it can't give you love. Mm -hmm. uh, right. mm -hmm. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I think what's exciting is that, you know, quantum mechanics has been around for 80 years now, but modern medicine, for the most part, operates day to day on Newtonian mechanics, on a very defined understanding of cause and effect, and that there there is no connection between mind and body. I mean, science depends on that dualism at a really deep level, partly because of the physics that still rules in quantum mechanics is not a theory, it's indisputable fact. And it is a um, fact, an indisputable fact that our consciousness is deeply involved in terms of what we see and sense and touch in the physical world to the point that some physicists say um, the material world doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think what's exciting is that now through Silicon Valley, uh, physicists are taught to not ask questions in the same way that doctors are in some ways, um, but, you can, but they, they say don't ask the questions, we don't know what to do with that, with uh, what that means, but you mm -hmm. can apply the math. And use the math, it is creating a new world, it is giving us a digital world, it's putting but it is bringing together mind and body, and it's democratizing the world rapidly to the point that our smartphones are now becoming, I think eventually will become the tricorders mm -hmm. of Star Trek, and will allow us to take charge of our health in a way that no doctor who sees you 15 minutes a month can begin mm -hmm. to, to do, and allows it puts the power back into our hands, I think. But um, that's, that piece is important, but also love and connection, I think, as the knowledge is more and more put into our peripheral phones and into these digitized solutions, um, doctors will be um, accepted for training in the medical school not based upon how much they can memorize, but more and more for their ability to connect and for their mm -hmm. ability to be a coach rather than the expert on your life and your body, even mm -hmm. though they only have 15 minutes with you. Yeah, we're going to explore more deeply the um, whole relationship of us and AI um, towards the end of the series on April the 20th with Rana El Kayubi, who will be here with Kevin Oxner um, to talk about uh, how we can humanize AI before it dehumanizes us. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a really interesting session. Yes, we had two questions in the middle of the house, um, either side. There's this gentleman there, Dabin, thank you. Why don't you go first, sir? Thank you. Yes, I'm pointing to you. Okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin, and uh, my question is about right brain and left brain. Mm -hmm. I used to work for a company that uh, developed educational strategies based on right brain and left brain, mm -hmm. but it's treated now like that snake oil. Mm -hmm. And I was even, uh, I asked this question of Dan Siegel, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. because he kind of talked about right brain and left brain years ago. Mm -hmm. But n now, and the question is, yeah, I guess we really can't talk about right brain, left brain anymore. 
Um, what, what, you know, I'm confused about that. Let me help you out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so there are certain things that we believed back in the 70s that we attributed very extreme to the right brain and very extreme to the left brain. And the right brain was doing some very specific things and the left brain was doing some very specific things. And you cut that corpus callosum with Roger Sperry, who won the Nobel Prize in 81 for doing that work. And um, there's no question that for certain things, there is there's a group of cells for the motor cortex in the right hemisphere that no question about it control the left half of the body and vice versa. There's no question that the sensory systems, so we're looking at motor and sensation coming into the body, are very specifically organized and separated. But then we have some very, very sophisticated things that the brain does. Now, the thing about the brain is that, see, I just got very excited. The thing about the brain is that there are cells and they get very excited. They all get very excited. And one group of cells in one hemisphere will reach over through that corpus callosum, it's what it's for, to inhibit other cells in the exact same position so that these cells become the dominant cells. So let's say, for example, just language, if it's going to be the ability for me to speak. If you read from left to right, then the way that the eye organizes information and brings language into the left hemisphere, there's a group of cells there designed to operate my apparatus so I can speak language. You have comparably shaped cells in the opposite hemisphere, but they're doing other things unless we experience trauma over here and then they can take possibly take over that job it's easier for that to happen if you're in puberty or pre-puberty okay so so at, and then there's another group of cells that that is is placing meaning on those words so we know this if you have a stroke like mine and you wipe out the left hemisphere you're going to wipe out certain functions there are also those comparable cells in the opposite hemisphere that have some of those abilities but the point the difference between what we used to believe and what we now believe is that the brain different parts of the brain in this instant inside of your mind are working and so you have all this stuff going on as opposed to just, well, there's just this going on and just that going on. So there is no question, and based on, I mean, anybody, you meet anybody with stroke, and um, uh, you, you, know, you have a very specific lesion, you have a very specific problem, um, but it's the overall big picture. And anytime anybody ever comes to me and says, Jill, the brain doesn't work like that. They've proven that the right brain, left brain isn't true. I always say to them, which part exactly of what they used to believe are you talking about? Because I'm more than happy to introduce you to the way it happens as we understand it to be. So it's not that there's just the left brain happening or there's the right brain happening, but there's this delicate interplay between them and at any, but you do have the conscious ability to shift into certain skill sets because there's no question of those skill sets in that particular part of the brain. Did that help at all? It, it helps a lot. Are, are you gonna include that in your new book? I will, oh. you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> we had a question in the middle of the house, hello. Hi, hi there. Um, I have a food question. <clears throat> I'm sure everyone in the audience is not gonna be um, eating sugary, pointy things <laughs> for a while. Um, but my question is, um, like Jill, I had a stroke. I'm a baby, though. I only had it five years ago. Um, but when I came out of the stroke, they just said, here's a pamphlet with a bunch of vegetables, like, good luck, kid. And so I didn't really know um, what to eat, how to eat. I also couldn't taste for a while, so I didn't like eating anyway. Um, now I'm at a point where I hear these words you're saying about it's not a this problem, it's an inflammatory problem, mm. and I want to take care of that. Mm. But also, blueberries are the size of my face right now, and I'm trying to understand how do you eat well and really do that in a mindful way in mm. a world where every time you look at the ingredients, you can't pronounce anything, you don't know what it is and what it does yeah. to your body and your brain. Yeah, mm -hmm. great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think a genuine understanding of nutrition is a big deal because 
I think as doctors, we're given a lot of misinformation about what nutrition is, and I think nutritionists are too, much of the time, mm -hmm. um, I think. And so, you know, as a doctor I see, and I ask a lot what people eat, and pretty, and I used to think I eat healthy. I just didn't pay attention to all of the um, exceptions I made with the cold pizza in the nurse's station and the brownies mm -hmm. and the cookies that are always present. You know, I just didn't really count that in. And, <laughs> and what I, I think what's true is I think mm -hmm. that most of us think we eat pretty healthy and most of us don't actually. Mm -hmm. And so it was, I, what I didn't realize was how addicted I was to sugar. Um, there was a book called Eat to Live by Joel Furman that a number of the patients that I, a few of the patients that I talked to um, was revolutionary for them in terms of um, changing the way they Eight. And, and what they have told me is it's not about the food groups, it's not about um, counting calories, it's not about reading labels, it's about making sure that the foods you eat are nutritionally dense, that they are packed with the most uh, phytochemicals, uh, micronutrients, and, uh, and minerals that, that are possible. And so it turns out that that eliminates most of the foods I was used to eating. <laughs> so, so <laughs> you know, all the chips and the potatoes and the, um, all these different things and the starches and the refined flours and a lot of the foods that are taught to be healthy, uh, that say they're healthy, like the wheat bread that says it's whole wheat bread, but it's actually enriched wheat flour. And that's basically like sugar in your system. There was a lot to learn. And what I didn't realize was how addicted I was to sugar. And I began to realize, oh, I'm not hungry, I'm addicted. And that true hunger is really different from the cravings of having been away from sugar or refined flowers for six hours or something. And so it's been a lot to learn, but, but what I tell people is read the book Eat to Live. It's not the only approach. I think Michael Pollan's work is great. John Robbins' work is great. There's some really clear voices out there that really understand nutrition. And I'm telling you, I have seen so many people that will read those books and then their health changes mm -hmm. incredibly.